Hello and welcome to the Virtual Hammer Museum coming to you from Los Angeles. I'm Claudia Bester and I'm the Director of Hammer Public Programs and I want to welcome you all to the 116th anniversary of the day on which James Joyce's epic novel Ulysses takes place, June 16th, 1904. All around the world, Joyce fans celebrate Bloom's Day, named for the novel's protagonist, Leopold Bloom. It's 3 a.m. in Dublin right now, but I'm sure there are plenty of people still celebrating there, just as they are in France, Italy, Hungary, the Czech Republic, Canada, the UK, Australia, and all over the United States. This is the 11th annual Bloomsday at the Hammer, and for 10 years, our Bloomsday programs were organized by Joyce fanatic Stanley Breitbart, who decided to retire last year. So we'd like to thank him for 10 extraordinary years as a curator of Bloomsday, which included being a dramaturge, bringing together a wonderful tribe of actors and musicians, and directing performances, all in the name of promoting a greater understanding of James Joyce's magnum opus. Thank you, Stanley. This one is for you. Ulysses is a thoroughly modern novel. Some have described it as comprising all of life in a day. As Leopold Bloom wanders around Dublin on June 16th, he encounters birth, death, loss, grief, joy, sex, love, work, parenthood, friendship, prejudice, religion, and the full spectrum of human emotions that add up to the complexity, mundacity, sorrow, and beauty of the human experience. Some people find Ulysses impenetrable at first with all of its stream of conscious interior monologues, made up words and obscure references. But we find that once you open it up and hear the sheer beauty of the language and the fun and vitality and irreverence and yet seriousness of the book, you too will understand why Vladimir Nabokov called it the greatest masterpiece of 20th century prose. In tonight's special pandemic version of Bloomsday, we read from an adaptation by Mary Durkin with excerpts from six episodes in the book as well as performances of seven of the songs referenced within the text. There's something in here to delight and offend everyone, including and perhaps especially Joyce scholars. We have an incredibly talented group of performers and it's a real treat to see them bring this book of art to life. So now let us all be transported to 1904 Dublin with a rendition of the classic Irish folk song, Molly Malone. The opening scene of Ulysses takes place on the morning of Thursday, June 16th, 1904, in a Martello Tower in Sandy Cove, on the southern rim of Dublin Bay. Stephen Dedalus, the Joyce character in the novel, is staying there as a guest of a college friend, Oliver St. John Gogarty, otherwise known as Buck Mulligan. Stephen had been studying in Paris when he received a telegram that read, Mother dying, come home, father. Stately, plump Buck Mulligan came from the stairhead, bearing a bowl of lather in which a mirror and razor lay crossed. A yellow dressing gown, ungirdled, was sustained gently behind him on the mild morning air. He held the bowl aloft and intoned, Im troi bo ad altari dei. Halted, he peered down the dark winding stairs and called out hoarsely, Come up, Kench! Come up, you fearful Jesuit! Solemnly, he came forward and mounted the round gun rest. He faced about and blessed gravely thrice the tower, the surrounding land, and the awaking mountains. Then, catching sight of Stephen Dedalus, he bent towards him and made rapid crosses in the air, gurgling in his throat and shaking his head. 
Stephen Dedalus, displeased and sleepy, leaned his arms on the top of the staircase and looked coldly at the shaking, gurgling face that blessed him, at wine in its lent, and at the light on tonsured hair, grained and hued like pale oak. Buck Mulligan peeped an instant under the mirror and then covered the bowl smartly. Back to barracks! For this so dearly beloved is the genuine Christine body and soul and blood and ooms. Slow music, please. Shut your eyes, gents. Uh, one moment. A little trouble about those white corpuscles. This is a silence all. He peered sideways up and gave a long, slow whistle of call, then paused a while in rapt attention. Two strong, shrill whistles answered through the cam. Thanks, old chap. That will do nicely. Switch off the current, will you? He skipped off the gun rest and looked gravely at Dedalus, his watcher. Gathering about his legs the loose folds of his gown, the plump shadowed face and sullen oval jowl recalled a prelate, patron of the arts in the Middle Ages. The, the mockery of it! Your absurd name, an ancient Greek! Stephen Dedalus stepped up, following him wearily halfway and sat down on the edge of the gun rest, watching him still as he propped his mirror on the parapet, dipped the brush in the bowl and lathered cheeks and neck. Ah, my name is absurd too. Malachy Mulligan. Two dactyls. But it has a Hellenic ring, hasn't it? Tripping and sunny like the book himself. You know, we must go to Athens. Will you come, if I can get the ant to fork out 20 quid? He brushed this bush, he laid the brush aside and laughing with delight cried, <laughs> Will he come, the jejun Jesuit? Tell me, Mulligan. Yes, my love. How long is Haynes going to stay in this tower? Buck Mulligan showed a shaved cheek over his right shoulder. God, isn't he dreadful? A ponderous Saxon. You know, he thinks you're not a gentleman. God, these bloody English, bursting with money and indigestion. Because he comes from Oxford. You know, Daedalus, you have the real Oxford manner. He can't make you out. Oh, my name for you is the best. Kinch, the knife blade. He shaved warily over his chin. He was raving all night about a black panther. Where is his gun case? Oh, a woeful lunatic. Were you in a funk? I was, out here in the dark with a man I don't know, raving and moaning to himself about shooting a black panther. You saved men from drowning. I'm not a hero, however. If he stays on here, I am off. Buck Mulligan frowned at the lather on his razor blade. He hopped down from his perch and began to search his trouser pockets hastily. Scuffer! He came over to the gun rest and, thrusting a hand into Stephen's upper pocket, said, then does alone your nose rag to wipe my razor. Stephen suffered him to pull out and hold up on show by its corner a dirty crumpled handkerchief. Buck Mulligan wiped the razor neatly. Then, gazing over the handkerchief, he said, The bard's nose rag. A new art colour for our Irish poets. Not green. You can almost taste it, can't you? He mounted the parapet again and gazed out over Dublin Bay. God, isn't the sea what algae calls it? A great sweet mother, the snot green sea, the scrotum tightening sea. Epionopa ponton ad Douglas. The Greeks, the latter. A voice within the tower called loudly, Are you up there, Mulligan? Coming! Look at the sea. What does it care about offences? Chuck Loyola, kin, should come on down. The Sassanach wants his morning rashers. Now don't mope over it all day. I'm inconsequent. Give up the moody brooding. His head vanished, but the drone of his descending voice boomed out of the stairhead. I'm the queerest young fellow that ever you heard. My mother's a Jew, my father's a bird. With Joseph the joiner I cannot agree. So here's to disciples and Calvary. If anyone thinks that I am not divine, he'll get no three free drinks when I'm making the wine, but have to drink water and wish it were play that I make when the wine becomes water again. Goodbye now, goodbye, write down all that I said. Tell Tom, Dick and Harry I rose from the dead. What's bred in the bone cannot fail me to fly. 
And all of its breezy goodbye now, goodbye. Wood shadows floated silently by through the morning peace from the stairhead seaward where he gazed. Inshore and farther out, the mirror of the water whitened, spurned by light shod hurrying feet, white breast of the dim sea, the twining stresses two by two, hand plucking the harp strings, merging their twining chords, wave white wedded words shimmering on the dim tide. The cloud began to cover the sun slowly, shadowing the bay in deeper green. Kinch, wake up! Uh, bread, butter, honey. Haynes, come in. Grub's ready. Bless us, the Lord, and these thy gifts. Where's the sugar? Ah, gee, there's no milk. Stephen fetched the loaf and the pot of honey and the butter cooler from the locker. Buck Mulligan sat down in a sudden pet. Ah, what sort of kip is this? I told her to come at eight. We can drink it black. There's lemon in the locker. Oh, damn you and your Paris fads. I want Sandy Cove milk. Haynes came in from the doorway. That woman is coming up with the milk. Ah, the blessings of God on you. Sit down. Pour out the tea there. Sugar's in the bag. Here, I can't go fumbling at the damned eggs. He hacked through the fry on the dish and slapped it out on three plates, saying, In nomine patris et fili et spiritus sancti. The doorway was darkened. By an entering form. The milk, sir. Ah, come in, ma'am. Kinch, get the jug. It's a lovely morning, sir. Glory be to God. To whom? Oh, oh to be sure. Stephen reached back and took the milk jug from the locker. The islanders speak frequently of the collector of prepuces. How much, sir? A quart. He watched her pour into the measure and thence into the jug rich white milk, not hers, old shrunken paps. She poured again a measureful and a tilly. Old in secret, she had entered from a morning world, maybe a messenger. She praised the goodness of the milk, pouring it out, crouching by a patient cow at daybreak in the lush field, a witch on her toadstool, her wrinkled fingers quick at the squirting dugs. They lowed about her whom they knew, due silky cattle. Silk of the kine and poor old woman, names given to her in old times, a wandering crone, lowly form of an immortal serving her conqueror and her gay betrayer, their common co-queen, a messenger from the secret morning, to serve or to upbraid whether he could not tell, but scorned to beg her favour. It is indeed, ma'am, Buck Mulligan said, pouring milk into their cups. Taste it, sir. He drank at her bidding. Oh, if we could live on good food like that, we wouldn't have the country full of rotten teeth and rotten guts, living in a bog swamp, eating cheap food and the streets paved with dust, horse dung and consumptive spits. Are you a medical student, sir? I am. Oh, look at that now. Stephen listened in scornful silence. She bows her head to a voice that speaks to her loudly, her bone setter, her medicine man. Me, she slights, to the voice that will shrive and oil for the grave. All there is of her, but her woman's unclean loins of man's flesh made, not in God's likeness, the serpent's prey. And to the loud voice that now bids her to be silent with wondering unsteady eyes. Call us a tattoo on Colleen Das. Do you understand what he says? Is it French you're talking, sir? An Aquilan Lagerholm? Irish! Is there Gaelic on you? Oh, I thought it was Irish by the sound of it. Are you from the West, sir? I am an Englishman. He's English! And he thinks we ought to speak Irish in Ireland. Well, sure we ought to. I'm ashamed I don't speak the language myself. I'm told it's a grand language by them that knows. Rand is no name for us. Wonderful, entirely. Fill out some more tea there, Kinch. Kinch, wait, would, you like a, uh, would you like a cup, ma'am? Oh, no, no, thank you, sir, the old woman said, slipping the ring of the milk can on her forearm and about to go. Have you your bill? We had better pay her mulligan, hadn't we? Uh, bill, well, sir, it's seven mornings a pint at two pence. The seven twos is a shilling and two pence over, and these three mornings a quart at Fourpence is three quarts is a shilling. 
That's a shilling and one and two is two and two, sir. Buck Mulligan sighed, and having filled his mouth with a crust thickly buttered on both sides, stretched forth his legs and began to search his trouser pockets. Pay up and look pleasant. Stephen filled a third cup, a spoonful of tea colouring faintly the thick, rich milk. Buck Mulligan brought up a florin, twisting it round in his fingers and cried, <laughs> A miracle! He passed it along the table towards the old woman. Ask nothing more of me, sweet. All I can give you, I give. Stephen laid the coin in her uneager hand. Below two pence. Time enough, sir, she said, taking the coin. Time enough. Good morning, sir. She curtsied and went out, followed by Buck Mulligan's tender chant. Heart of my heart were it more. More would be laid at your feet. No, serious, Tedalus, I'm stony. Hurry out to your school kip and bring us back some money. Today the bards must drink and junk it. Ireland expects that every man shall do his duty. On the morning of June 16th, 1904, Mr. Leopold Bloom of 7 Eccles Street is up preparing breakfast for his wife, Molly, that is, Marion Bloom, soprano, who is upstairs sleeping in the brass bed brought by her family from Gibraltar and which has witnessed concupiscence, not always of a matrimonial nature. Mr. Leopold Bloom ate with relish the inner organs of beasts and fowls. He liked thick giblet soup. Nutty gizzards, a stuffed roast heart, liver slices fried with crust crumbs, fried hen cods rolls. But most of all, he liked the grilled mutton kidneys, which gave to his palate a fine tang of faintly scented urine. Kidneys were on his mind as he moved about the kitchen softly, writing her breakfast things on the humpy tray. Gelid light and air were in the kitchen, but out of doors, gentle summer morning everywhere. Made him feel a bit peckish. The coals were reddening. Mm -hmm. Another slice of bread and butter. Three, four, right. She didn't like our plate full. Right. He turned from the tray, lifting the kettle off the hob, and set it sideways on the fire. It sat there, dull and squat, its spout stuck out. Cup of tea soon. Good. Mouth dry. The cat walked stiffly round a leg of the table with tail on high. Meow. Oh, there you are. The cat mewed in answer and stalked again stiffly round a leg of the table. Meow. Just though she stalked over my writing table. Purr. Scratch my head. Mr. Bloom watched curiously, kindly, the lithe black form clean to see the gloss of her sleek hide, the white button under the butt of her tail, the green flashing eyes. He bent down to her, his knee, hands on his knees. Milk for the pussins. <laughs> we call them stupid. They understand what we say better than we understand them. She understands all she wants to. Vindictive too. Cruel. Her nature. Curious mice never squeal. Seem to like it. Wonder what I look like to her. Height of a tower. No, she can jump me. Afraid of the chicken she is. Afraid of the chuck chucks. I never saw such a stupid pussins as the pussins. Yeah. <laughs> Holdy. Entering the bedroom, he half closed his eyes and walked through the warm yellow twilight towards her tousled head. Who are the letters for? Looked at them, Mullingar, Millie. A letter for me from Millie and a card to you. And a letter for you. He dropped her card and letter on the twill bread spread near the curve of her leg. Do you want the blind up? Letting the blind up by gentle tugs halfway, his backward eye saw her glance at the letter and tuck it under the pillow. That do? She was reading the card, propped on her elbow. She got the things. He waited till she had laid the card aside and curled herself back slowly with a snug sigh. Will you hurry up with that tea? I'm parched. The kettle, it's boiling. 
but he delayed to clear the chair, his, her striped petticoat, tossed soiled linen, and lifted all in an armful on the foot of the bed. As he went down the kitchen stairs, she called. Paul D. Uh, what? Scald the teapot. On the boil, sure enough. A plume of steam from the spout. He scalded and rinsed out the teapot and put in four full spoons of tea, tilting the kettle then to let the water flow in. Having set it to draw, he took off the kettle, crushed the pan flat on the live coals and watched the lump of butter slide and melt. While he unwrapped the kidney, the cat mewed hungrily against him. Give her too much meat, she won't mouse. Say they won't eat pork. <laughs> Kosher. Here. He let the blood-smeared paper fall to her and dropped the kidney amid the sizzling butter sauce. Pepper. He sprinkled it through his fingers ringwise from the chipped egg cup. He prodded a fork into the kidney and slapped it over, then fitted the teapot on the tray, its hump bumped as he took it up. Everything on it, bread and butter, four sugar spoon, her cream, yes. He carried it upstairs, his thumb hooked in the teapot handle. Nudging the door open with his knee, he carried the tray and set it on the chair by the bedhead. What a time you were. She set the brasses jingling as she raised herself briskly, an elbow on the pillow. He looked calmly down on her bulk and between her large, soft boobs, sloping with her nightdress like a she-goat's udder. The warmth of her couched body rose on the air, mingling with the fragrance of the tea she poured. A strip of torn envelope peeped from under the dimpled pillow. In the act of going, he stayed to straighten the bedspread. Who is the letter from? Oh, Boylan. He's bringing the program. What are you singing? La Chi Daram with J.C. Doyle and Love's Old Sweet Song. Her full lips drinking smiled. Rather stale smell that incense leaves next day, like foul flower water. Uh, would you like the window open a little? She doubled a slice of bread into her mouth, asking, what time is the funeral? Eleven, I think. I didn't see the paper. Following the pointing of her finger, he took up a leg of her soiled drawers from the bed. No. Then a twisted grey garter looped round a stocking, rumpled, <sighs> shiny sole. No. That book. Other stocking. Her petticoat. Oh, it must have fell down. Felt here and there. Folio e non varehe. Wonder if she pronounces that right, though, Leo. And uh, not on the bed, must have slid down. He stopped and lifted the valance. The book fallen sprawled against the bulge of the orange keyed chamber pot. Show here. I put a mark in it. There's a word I wanted to ask you. She swallowed a draught of tea from the cup held by the knot handle and having wiped her finger smartly on the blanket, began to search the text with a hairpin till she reached the word. Met. Him what? Here. What does that mean? He leaned downwards and read near her polished thumbnail. Metempsychosis. Yes. Who's he when he's at home? Metempsychosis. It's Greek. From the Greek. That means the transmigration of souls. Oh, rocks. Tell us in plain words. He smiled, glancing askance at her mocking eyes. The same young eyes. The first night after the charades. Dolphin's barn. Did you finish it? Yes. There's nothing smutty in it. Is she in love with the first fella all the time? Never read it. D do you want another? Oh, yes. Get another of Paul de Cox. Nice name he has. She poured more tea into her cup, watching it flow sideways. Must get that Capel Street Library book renewed or they'll write to Kearney, my guarantor. Reincarnation, that's the word. Some people believe that we go on living in another body after death, that we lived before. They call it reincarnation, that we all lived before on the earth thousands of years ago or some other planet. They say we've forgotten it. Some say they remember their past lives. He turned the pages back. Methampsychosis is what the ancient Greeks called it. They used to believe you could be changed into an animal or a tree, for instance. What they call nymphs, for example. 
Her spoon ceased to stir up the sugar. She gazed straight before her, inhaling through her arched nostrils. There's a smell of burn. Did you leave anything on the fire? The kidney! It's midday, and Bloom is in the city centre involved in the business of the day. He's dropped into Weston Road Church, attended the funeral of an old friend, Paddy Dignam, ordered special soap for Molly, scrubbed himself in the public baths, sold an ad in the National Library. Now he's in need of refreshment. Throughout it all, Bloom is aware of the nagging thought that Blazes Boylan, Molly's impresario and suspected lover, will be a visiting her at 4 p.m. His smile faded as he walked, a heavy cloud hiding the sun, slowly shading Trinity's surly front. Trams passed one another, ingoing, outgoing, clanging. Useless words. Things go on, same, day after day. Squads of police, marching out, back, trams in, out. Those two loonies mooching about. Dignam carted off. One born every second somewhere, other dying every second. Since I fed the boards five minutes, 300 kicked the bucket. Over 300 born, washing the blood off, all are washed in the blood of the lamb, bawling, ma! City full passing away, other city full coming. Passing away too, others coming on, passing on. Houses. Lines of houses, streets, miles of pavement, pulled up bricks, stones, changing hands, disowner that, landlord never dies, they say. Others step into his shoes when he gets his notice to quit. They buy the place up with gold and still, they have all the gold, swindling it somewhere, piled up in cities, Worn away, age after age. Pyramids and sand, built on bread and onions. Slaves, Chinese wall, Babylon. Big stones left, round towers. Rest rubble, sprawl and suburbs. Jerry built. Kerwin's mushroom houses built a breeze. Shelter for the night. No one is anything. This is the very worst hour of the day. Vitality, dull, gloomy, hate this hour. Feel as if I'd been eaten and spewed. Oh, Mr. Blue, how do you do? Oh, how do you do, Mrs. Breen? Oh, no use complaining. How is Molly these times? I haven't seen her for ages. Oh, in the pink. Millie has a position down in Mullingar, you know. No way, isn't that grand for her? Yes, in a photographer's there. Getting on like a house on fire. How are all your charges? All in the baker's list. How many has she? No other in sight. You're in black, I see. You, you have no... No, no. I've just come from a funeral. I want to crop up all day, I foresee. Who's dead? When? And what did he die of? Turn up like a bad penny. Oh, dear me. I hope it wasn't any near to relation. May as well get our sympathy. Dignam, an old friend of mine. He died quite suddenly, poor fellow. Heart trouble, I believe. Funeral was this morning. Your funeral's tomorrow. Well, you're coming through the roy. Diddle, diddle, dum, dum. Diddle, diddle, I. Oh, sad to lose the old friends. Well, that's quite enough about that. Just quietly husband. Change the subject. And your lord and master. Ugh, don't be talking. He's a caution to rattlesnakes. He's in there now with his law books, finding out the law of libel. He has me heart scalded. Wait till I show you. Opening our handbag, chipped leather, hat pin. I'll have a guard on those things. Stick it in a chap's eye on the tram. Rummaging. Open money. Please take one. This devils, if they lose six months, raise cane, husband barging. 
Where's the 10 shillings I gave you on Monday? Are you feeding your little brother's family? Soiled handkerchief, medicine bottle, pastel that was fell. What is she looking for? There must be a new moon out. He's always bad then. Do, do you know what he did last night? Her hand ceased to rummage. Her eyes fixed themselves on him wide in alarm, yet smiling. What? Woke me up in the middle of the night. Dream he had, a nightmare. Said the ace of spades was walking up the stairs. The ace of spades? She took a folded postcard from her handbag. Here, read that postcard. He got it this morning. What is it? U.P. U.P. Up. Someone's taken a rise out of him, and it's a great shame for them, whoever he is. Indeed it is. And now he's going round to Men Menton's office. He's going to take an action for £10,000. She folded the card into her untidy bag and snapped the catch. Same blue serge dress she had two years ago. The knot bleaching. Seen its best days. Whispish hair over her ears. And that dowdy toque. Three old grapes to take the arm out of it. Shabby genteel. She used to be a tasty dresser. Lines around her mouth. Only a year or so older than Molly. See the eye that woman gave her passing. Cruel. The unfair sex. Do you ever see anything of Mrs. Beaufoy? Me and a Purefoy? Yes. Oh, I, I just called to ask on the way in, is she over it? She's in the lying in hospital in Hollis Street. Dr. Horn got her in. She's three days bad now. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Yes, and a house full of kids at home. It's a very stiff birth. The nurse told me. Oh. His heavy, pitying gaze absorbed her news. His tongue clacked in compassion. I'm sorry to hear that, poor thing. Three days. That's terrible for her. Mm, she was taken bad on the Tuesday. Mr. Bloom touched her funny bone gently. Warning. Warning. Let this man pass. A bony form strode along the curbstone from the river, staring with a rapt gaze into the sunlight through a heavy, stringed glass. Tight as a skull piece, a tiny hat gripped his head. From his arm, a folded dust coat, a stick and an umbrella dangled to his stride. Watch him. He always walks outside the lampposts. What? What is he, if it's a fair question? I is he dotty? His name is Cashel Boyle O'Connor Fitzmaurice Tistle Farrell. <laughs> Watch. He has enough of them. Then it will be like that one of these days. She broke off suddenly. There he is. I must go after him. Uh, goodbye. Uh, you remember me to Molly, won't you? I will. He watched her dodge through passers towards the shop fronts. Dennis Bean in skimpy frock coat and blue canvas shoes shuffled out of Harrison's, hugging two heavy tomes to his ribs. Blown in from the bay, like old times. He suffered her to overtake him without surprise and thrust his dull grey beard towards her, his loose jaw wagging as he spoke earnestly. Miss Sugar, others jump. You pay up. <laughs> I'll take my oath. That's Alf Bergen or Richie Goulden wrote it for a lark in the Scotch House. I'll bet anything. Round to Menton's office. His oyster always staring at the postcard. Be a feast for the gods. Poor Dignam. Well, it is a long rest. Feel no more. It's the moment you feel death coming. Must be damned unpleasant. Can't believe the forced. A uh, mistake must be uh, someone else. Try the house opposite. Wait, oh, I wanted to. Live, I haven't yet. Then darkened death chamber whispering around you. Would you like to see a priest? Then rambling and wandering, delirium all you hid, all your life to death struggle. His sleep is not natural. Press his lower eyelid. Watching is his nose pointed, is his jaw sinking. Are the soles of his feet yellow? Pull the pillow away and finish it off. On the floor since he's doomed. Out of the frying pan of life into the fire of purgatory. This place gives you the creeps after a bit. 
plenty to see and hear and feel yet. Feel live warm beings near you. Let them sleep in their maggoty beds. They're not going to get me this innings. Warm bed, warm, full-blooded life. Bloom decides to have his lunch in one of his favourite haunts, Davy Burns, just off Grafton Street in the centre of Dublin. Incidentally, Davy Burns is still there. Bloom entered Davy Burns. Moral pub. He doesn't chat. Stands a drink now and then, but in a leap year once and four. Cashed a cheque for me once. What will I take now? He drew his watch. Let me see now, Shandy Gaff. Hello, Bloom. Nosy Flynn said from his nook. Hello, Flynn. How's things? Let me see. I'll take a glass of Burgundy and let me see. Sardines on the shelves. Almost taste them by looking. Sandwich. Ham and his descendants mustard and bread there. Potted meats. What is home without plum trees, potted meat? Incomplete. What a stupid ad. Have you a cheese sandwich? Uh, yes, sir. I think a few olives too, if they had them. Italian, I prefer. Good glass of burgundy. Take away that. Lubricate. A nice salad. Cool as a cucumber. Tom Kiernan can dress. Puts gusto into it. Pure olive oil. Millie served me that cutlet with a sprig of parsley. Take one Spanish onion. God made foods. The devil the cooks. <laughs> Deviled crab. Wife well? Oh, quite well. Thanks. A, a cheese sandwich then. Uh, Gorgonzola, have you? Hmm. Rosie Flynn sipped his grog. Doing any singing those times? Look at his mouth. Could whistle in his own ear. Flap ears to match. Music knows as much about it as my coachman. Still, better tell him. Does no harm, free ad. She's engaged for a big tour at the end of this month. You may have heard, perhaps. No? Ha! Huh. That's the style. Who's getting it on? Bylan. Liz is Bylan. The curate served. Uh, how much is that? Uh, 70, sir. Thank you, sir. Mr. Bloom cut his sandwich into slender strips. Mr. McTrigger, easier than the dreamy, creamy stuff. His 500 wives at the time of their lives. Uh, mustard, sir. Thank you. He studded under each lifted strip yellow blobs. He smelt sipped a cordial juice and bidding his throat to speed it, set his wine glass delicately down. Yes, he's the organizer in point of fact. No fear, no brains. Nosy Flynn snuffled and scratched. Flea, having a good square meal. Bylan had a good slice of luck, Jack Mooney was telling me, over that boxing match. Myler Kea won against that soldier in the part of Bellow Barracks. My God, he had the little kipper down in the county Carlow, he was telling me. 
Hope that dewdrop doesn't come down into his glass. No, he snuffed it up. For near a month, man, before it came off, sucking duck eggs, by God, till fond on others. Keep him off the booze, see? Oh, by God, blazes is a hairy chap. Davy Byrne came forward from the hind bar in tuck-stitched shirt sleeves, cleaning his lips with two wipes of his napkin. Herring's blush, whose smile upon each feature plays with such and such replete, too much fat on the parsnips. Oh, and here's himself and pepper on him. Can you give us a good one for the gold cup? <laughs> I'm off that, Mr. Flynn. I never put anything on a horse. You're right there. Mr. Bloom ate his strips of sandwich, fresh clean bread with relish of disgust, pungent mustard, the fishy savour of green cheese. Sips of his wine soothed his palate. That logwood, that tastes fuller. This weather with the chill off. Nice quiet bar. Nice piece of wood in that counter. Nicely planed. Like the way it curves there. I wouldn't do anything at all in that line. Ruin many a man, the same horses. Bittner sweepstakes. Licence for the sale of beer, wine and spirits for consumption on the premises. Heads I win, tails you lose. True for you, unless you're in the now. <laughs> There's no straight spark going now. Lenehan gets some good ones. He's given scepter today. Zinfandel's the favourite. Lord Howard de Walden's one at Epsom. Morney Cannon is riding him. I could have got seven to one against St. Amund's a fortnight before. That's so. Davy Byrne went towards the window and, taking up the petty cash book, scanned its pages. I could fit. That was a rare bit of horse flesh. St. Frusquin was her sire. She won in a thunderstorm. Rothschild's filly with wadding in her ears. Blue jacket and yellow cap. Bad luck to Big Ben Dollard and his John of God. He put me off it. He drank resignedly from his tumbler, running his fingers down the fruits. Aye. Mr. Bloom, champing, standing, looked upon his sigh. That was he numbskull. Well, I tell him that horse Lenehan. He knows already. Better let him forget. Go and lose more, fool and his money. Jew drop coming down again. Cold nose he'd have kissing a woman. So they might like it. Prickly beards. They might like dogs, cold noses. Old Mrs. Reardon with the rumbling stomach, Sky Terrier in the City Arms Hotel. Molly fondling him in her lap. Oh, the big doggy bow wowsy wowsy. Wine soaked and softened, roll pith of bread, mustard, a moment of mawkish cheese. A nice wine it is. Tastes it better because I'm not thirsty. Bath, of course, does that. Just a bite or two. Then about six o'clock I can... Six, six. Time will be gone then. She. Mild fire of wine kindled his veins. I wanted that badly. Felt so off colour. His eyes on Hungary saw shelves of tins, sardines, gaudy lobsters, claws. All the odd things people pick up for food. Out of shells, periwinkles with a pin, off trees, snails out of the ground, the French eat, out of the sea with bait on a hook. Silly fish, learn nothing in a thousand years. If you didn't know, risky putting anything into your mouth. Mr. Bloom on his way out raised three fingers in greeting. So long, Bloom. Mr. Bloom turned over idly pages of The Awful Disclosures of Maria Monk, then of Aristotle's masterpiece. Crooked, botched print. Plates, infants cuddled in a ball in blood red wombs like livers of slaughtered cows. Lots of them like that at this moment all over the world, all button with their skulls to get out of it. Child born every minute somewhere. He laid both books aside and glanced at the third. Tales of the Ghetto by Leopold von Zacher Masoch. That I had. The shopman let two volumes fall on the counter. Them are good ones. 
Onion's off his breath. <laughs> Coming across the counter out of his ruined mouth. He bent to make a bundle of the other books, hugged them against his unbuttoned waistcoat, and bore them off through the dingy curtain. Mr. Bloom, alone, looked at the titles. Fair Tyrants by James Loveborch. No, she wouldn't like that much. Got her at once. He read the other title. Sweets of Sin. Martin Horloin, let us see. He read where his finger opened. All the dollar bills her husband gave her were spent in the stores on wondrous gowns and costly as frillies. For him, for a who? Yes, this. Here, Troy, her mouth glued on his in a luscious, voluptuous kiss while his hands fell for the opulent curves inside her days of being. Yes, take this. The end. You are late, he spoke hoarsely, eyeing her with a suspicious glare. The beautiful woman threw off her sable trimmed wrap, displaying her queenly shoulders and heaving bosom, en pom pom. An imperceptible smile played around her perfect lips as she turned to him calmly. Mr. Bloom read again. The beautiful woman. <coughs> Flemmy coughs shook the air of the bookshop, bulging out the dingy curtain. The shopman's uncombed grey head came out and his unshaven reddened face coughing. He raked his throat rudely, spat phlegm on the floor. He put his boot on what he had spat, wiping his soul along it and bent, showing his raw skinned crown scantily haired. Mr. Bloom beheld it, mastering his troubled breath. He said, I'll take this one. The shopman lifted eyes, bleared with old room. Sweets of sin. Now that's a good one. Simon Dedalus, Stephen's father, like Joyce's own father, was a complicated man. He was a spoiled only child who started off with a healthy inheritance and in several houses. But as he preferred to drink and party rather than work, and as the family grew in size to 13 children, their social standing rapidly declined. Each move represented a further decline into poverty, until at this point, the family was living in abject poverty in a tenement on the north side of the city. Joyce had a complicated relationship with his father, who loved him dearly, and he always acknowledged how indebted he was to his dad for a large number of colourful characters in his stories. The lackey by the door of Dylan's auction rooms shook his handbell twice again and viewed himself in the chalked mirror of the cabinet. Dilly Dedalus, listening by the curbstone, heard the beats of the bell, the cries of the auctioneer within. Mr. Dedalus, tugging a long moustache, came round from William's row. He halted near his daughter. It's time for you. Stand up straight for the love of the Lord Jesus. Are you trying to imitate your Uncle John the cornet player? 
head upon his shoulders. Melancholy God. Dilly shrugged her shoulders. Mr. Dedalus placed his hands on them and held them back. Stand up straight, Gettle. You'll get curvature of the spine. Do you know what you look like? Give it up, Father. All the people are looking at you. Did you get any money? Where would I get money? There is no one in Dublin would lend me fortunes. You got some. How do you know that? I know you did. Were you in the Scotch house now? I was not then. Was it the little nuns taught you to be so saucy? Here, here's a shilling. See if you can do anything with that. Oh, I suppose you got five. Give me more than that. Wait a while. You're like the rest of them, are you? An insolent pack of little bitches since your poor mother died. But wait a while. You'll all get a short shrift and a long day from me. Low blackguardism. I'm going to get rid of you. Wouldn't care if I was stretched out stiff. He's dead. The man upstairs is dead. He left her and walked on. Dilly followed quickly and pulled his coat. Well, what is it? You got more than that. I'm going to show you a little trick. I leave you all where Jesus left the Jews. Look, that's all I have. I got two shillings from Jack Power and I spent two pence for a shave at the funeral. Can't you look for some money somewhere? I will. I looked all along the gutter in O'Connell Street. I've tried this one now. <laughs> You're very funny. <laughs> Here's two pence. Get a glass of milk for yourself and a bun or something. I'll be home shortly. He put the other coins in his pocket and started to walk on. I'm sure you have another shilling. <sighs> Mr. Dedalus, amid the din, walked off, murmuring to himself with a pursing, mincing mouth. The little nuns. Nice little things. Oh, sure they wouldn't do anything. Oh, sure they wouldn't really. Is it this little sister, Monica? Master Dignam, oldest son of the deceased Paddy Dignam, is walking home. I was too blooming dull sitting in the parlour. Mrs. Stower, Mrs. Quickly, Mrs. McDowell, and the blind down, and they all. Sorry. We go. You want to go from the top? Yeah. Thanks. Yep. Action. Master Dignam, oldest son of the deceased Paddy Dignam, is walking home. It was too blooming dull sitting in the parlour with Mrs. Stower, Mrs. Quigley, and Mrs. McDowell, and the blind down, and they all at their sniffles and sipping sups of their superior tawny sherry Uncle Barney brought from Tunney's, and they ate in crumbs of the cottage fruit cake, jawing the whole blooming time and sighing. Master Dignam walked along Nassau Street, shifted the pork steaks to his other hand. His collar sprang up again, and he tugged it down. The blummin' stud was too small for the buttonhole of the shot. Blummin' into it. He met schoolboys with satchels. I'm not going tomorrow either. Stay away till Monday. Do they notice I'm in mourning? Uncle Barney said he'd get it into the paper tonight. Did they all see it in the paper, read my name printed? And Pa's name. His face got all grey instead of being red like it was, and there was a fly walking over it up to his eyes. The scrunch that was when, when they were screwing the screws into the coffin, and the bumps when they were bringing it downstairs. The pa was inside it. Ma crying in the parlour, and Uncle Barney telling the men how to get around the bend. Big coffin it was, and high and heavy looking. What was that? The last night, Pa was boosed. He was standing on the landing there, bawling out for his boots to go out to Tunney's for the booze more. He looked butty and short in his shirt. 
is never see him again. Death, that is, Pa is dead. My father is dead. He told me to be a good son to Ma. I couldn't hear the other things he said, but I saw his tongue and his teeth trying to say it better. Poor Pa. That was Mr. Dignam, my father. I hope he's in purgatory now because he went to confession to Father Conroy on Saturday. Twas early, early in the spring The birds did whistle and sweetly sing Changing their notes from tree to tree And the song they sang was old Ireland free Twas early, early in the night Cavalry gave me a fright. The human cavalry was my downfall, and taken was I by the Lord Cornwall. In the Dungannon this young man died, and in Dungannon his body lies. And you good people that who pass by, oh shed a tear for the crappy boy. After Paddy Dignam's funeral, his cronies meet up in Barney Kiernan's pub. I was just passing the time of day with old Troy of the DNP at the corner of Arbor Hill there, and be damned, but a bloody sweep came along and he near drove his gear into my eye. I turned around to let him have the weight of my tongue, when who should I see dodging along Stony Baffer? Only Joe Hines. How are you blowing? Did you see the bloody chimney sweep near shove my eye out with his brush? Such luck! Who's the old bollocks you were talking to? Oh, old Troy was in the force. I'm on two minds not to give that fella in charge for obstructing the thoroughfare with his brooms and ladders. Are you a strict TT? Ah, uh, now I'm not taking anything between drinks, Joe. <laughs> what about paying our respects to our friend? The citizen? Having a great conflab with that bloody dog of his, Gary Owen. And he waiting for what the sky would drop in the way of a drink. Should it be a corporal work of mercy to take it and wring its bloody neck, me jail bastard. Stand and deliver! That's all right, citizen. Friends here. Pass, friends. Now back, yes. And what's your opinion of the... Oh, I think the markets is on the rise. Foreign wars is the cause of it. It's the Russians' wish to tyrannise. Barry, give over your bloody cotton, Joe. I'm blue mouldy for want of a point. Uh, three points there, Terry. Jesus, a quid. Were you robbing the poor box, Joe? Sweating me brow. It was the prudent member that gave me the wheeze on throwaway. Came in 20 to 1, rank outsider. <laughs> Bloom gave you the tip, huh? I saw him before I met you, sloping round be pill lane with his cod's eye out, counting up all the guts of the fish. Your health, down the form. Oh, declare to God I could hear that pint hit the pit of my stomach with a click. Ah, here's Alf. Uh, repeat the dose there, uh, Terry. Ah, may your shadows never grow less. How's Willie Morphy these times, Alf? I don't know. I just saw him now in Capel Street with Paddy Dignam. Oh, and I was running after that. With what? With who? With Dignam. Is it Paddy? Yes. 
Why? Do not know he's dead. Had he digging him dead? Why? Sure, I'm after seeing him not five minutes ago, plain as a pike staff. You saw his ghost then? <laughs> God between us and all harm. What? Good Christ. You're only five with Willie Murray with the, the two of them near what do you call it? What? Digging him dead? Dead? He's no more dead than you are. Oh, maybe so. But they took the liberty of burying him this morning anyhow. Pay the debt to nature. God be merciful on him. Good Christ. I could have sworn it was him. He was what you might call flabbergasted. <laughs> Come in, come in, he won't eat you. Ah, uh, hello, Bloom. What do you have? Oh, well, I don't really, not at this time. No offence. Besides, I promised Martin Cunningham I'd wait for him. Well, you know, if you insist, I'll just take a cigar. Cobb, he's the prudent member, and no mistake. And when's it going to end, huh? A new Ireland for the Irish? Talking about a new Ireland... He ought to go and get a new bloody dog, so he ought. Scratching his scabs and sniffling and sneezing all round the bloody place. A new Ireland built on the bounds of the glorious dead. Sinn Féin, Sinn Féin, wine. The friends we love are by our side and the foes we hate before us. Ah, uh, same again, Terry. Are you sure, Bloom? Thank you. No, I'm here to see Martin Cunningham about the matter of poor Dignam's insurance. Don't you see? You see, he, Dignam, I mean, he didn't serve any notice of the assignment of the company. And at the time, and nominally under the Act, the mortgagee can't be the receiver on the policy. Holy war. Well, oh, that's a good one if old Shylock's landed. So the wife comes out and top dog, eh? Well, that's a point for the wife's admirers. Who's admirers? The wife's advisors, I mean. It's on the march, the Irish language, to hell with the bloody brutal Sassanacs and their patois. They built the civilization on us. Civilization is what you mean. To hell with them. The course of a good for nothing god like sideways on their bloody thick lunged sons of whores. Gets! Any civilization they have, they stole from us. Tongue tied sons of bastards, ghosts. The Irish language and the Gaelic League and the Shonines that can't speak their own language. Christ, it will give you a heartburn on your arse. Ireland sober is Ireland free. All wind and piss like a ten-yard cat. Yeah, but what about the fighting navy that keeps our foes at bay? Yeah, I'll tell you what about it. Hell upon earth it is! Your glorious British Navy that bosses the earth. That's the great empire they boast about of drudges and whipped serfs. Well, isn't discipline the same everywhere? I mean, wouldn't it be the same here if you put force against force? We'll put force against force. We have our greater Ireland beyond the sea. They were driven out of house and home in black 47. Hey! They drove out the peasants in hordes, but those that came to the land of the free remember the land of bondage, and they will come again, and with a vengeance, the champions of Kathleen de Hulan. We were a long time waiting for that, season, since the poor old woman told us that the French were on the sea and landed at Kalala. The French! What did they ever do for us, the French? Set of dancing rascals, never what the roasted fat to Ireland. As for the Germans, haven't we had enough of those sausage eating bastards on the throne from George the Elector to the flatulent old bitch that's dead? <laughs> well, we'll have Edward the Peacemaker now. There's a bloody sight more pox than tax about that bio. Uh, could you make a hole in another point? Could a swim duck? Well, all countries have been persecuted. The history of the world is full of it, perpetuating national hatred among nations. But do you know what a nation means? A nation is the same people living in the same place. My God, then, if that's so, I'm a nation for I'm living the same place for five years. What is your nation, if I may ask? Ireland. 
I was born here, Ireland. Here, shove us over some old drink here. And I belong to a race too that is hated and persecuted. Also now, this very moment, this very instant, robbed, plundered, insulted, persecuted. Are you talking about the new Jerusalem? I'm talking about injustice. Right, stand up to it then with force like men. But it's no use. I say it's no use. Force, hatred, history, all that. That's not life for men and women, insult and hatred. It's the opposite of that. That's really life. What? Love. I mean, the opposite of hatred. I must go now, but if Martin comes, now you say, I'll be back in a second. A new apostle for the Gentiles. Universal love. Yeah, well, it, it sure, it, it's not what we're told. Love thy neighbour. Love, that chap. Beggar me neighbour is his motto. Love, my yeah. He's a nice pattern of a Romeo and Juliet. I know where he's going. He's going to collect his own shekels and throw away. Is it that white-eyed Kaffer that never backed a horse in anger in his life? Ah, here's Cunningham, the man that'll tell you all about it. Where's Blue? He said he'd be here. He's off to fraud and widows and orphans. Well, well, what is he, for God's sakes? I mean, a Jew or a Gentile or a Holy Roman or a swaddler? What the hell is he? Simple enough. A Hungarian Jew born in Ireland. That's the new messiah for Ireland. Ireland of saints and sages. Well, they're still waiting for their redeemer. For that matter, so are we. And every male that's born, they think it may be their messiah. And every Jew is in a tall state of excitement, so they say, till he knows if he's a father or a mother, expecting every moment will be his next. Oh, good God. You should have seen him before the son of his was born. Dead now, of course, dittering like it was him that was pregnant. Do you call that a man? I wonder did he ever put it out of sight. Well, a son was born anyway. And who does he suspect? It's a wise child that knows his own father. <laughs> God, there's many a true word spoken just. <laughs> Oh, Martin, I was just around the courthouse looking for you. I hope I'm not too late. No, 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 we're ready. Courthouse, my eye, and his pockets hanging down with gold and silver. Cute as a shithouse rat, mean bloody scut. Stand us a drink yourself, devil of sweet fear. All for number one. Three tears for Israel. Ara, sit down on the parliamentary side of your arse, for Christ's sake. And don't be making a public exhibition of yourself. Mendelssohn was a Jew, and Karl Marx, and Mercadante, and Spinoza. And the Saviour was a Jew, and his father was a Jew. Your God. He had no father. Let's get out of here. Who's God? Well, his uncle was a Jew. Your God was a Jew. Christ was a Jew like me. I I'll brain that bloody Jew man for using the holy name. By Jesus, I'll crucify him, so I will. Give us that biscuit box there. Stop it now, Aaron. We've got enough uh, no, trouble. Come on now. Hold Where on. is he till I mother him? Get up there, Blue. Drive off, Yarvi. Hey, hold on there, citizen. Did I kill her? What? After him, Gary. After him, by. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, there's always some bloody clown or other kicking up bloody murder about bloody nothing. Cop, it would turn the porter sour in your guts, so it would. And the last we saw was a bloody car round in the corner, an old sheep's face on it gesticulating, and the bloody mongrel after it with his lug back for all he was bloody well worth to tear him limb from limb. You never saw the like of it in all your born puff. I'm off. I'll be in for the last gospel. Then lo, they beheld him, even him, 
then bloom Elijah amid clouds and angels, ascend to the glory of the brightness at an angle of 45 degrees over Donahue's in Little Green Street, like a shot off a shovel. Here we are at Sandymount Strand later on that day with Gertie McDowell, Edie Boardman, Sissy Caffrey and the twins, Tommy and Jackie Caffrey. The three girlfriends were seated on the rocks, enjoying the evening scene and the air which was fresh but not too chilly. Many a time and oft were they wont to come there, to that favourite nook to have a cosy chat beside the sparkling waves and discuss matters feminine. Sissy Caffrey and Edie Boardman with the baby in the push car, and Tommy and Jackie Caffrey, two little curly-headed boys dressed in sailor suits with caps to match, and the name HMS Belle Isle printed on both. For Tommy and Jackie were twins, scarce four years old and very noisy and spoiled twins sometimes. But for all that, darling little fellows with bright merry faces and endearing ways about them, they were dabbling in the sand with the spades and buckets, building castles as children do, or playing with the big colored ball, happy as the day is long. And Edie Boardman was rocking the chubby baby to and fro in the push car, while that young gentleman fairly chuckled with delight. He was but 11 months and nine days old, and though still a tiny toddler, was just beginning to lisp his first babyish words. Sissy Caffrey bent over him to tease his fat little plucks and the dainty dimple in his chin. Now, baby, say out big. I want a drink of water. And baby prattled after her. A jink, a jink a jabo. Sissy Caffrey cuddled the wee chap, for she was awfully fond of children, so patient with little sufferers and Tommy Caffrey could never be got to take his castor oil unless it was Sissy Caffrey that held his nose and promised him the scatty heel of the loaf of brown bread with golden syrup on. What a persuasive power that girl had. But just then there was a slight altercation between Master Tommy and Master Jackie. Boys will be boys, and our two twins were no exception to this golden rule. The apple of discord was a certain castle of sand which Master Jackie had built and Master Tommy would have it right go wrong that it was to be architecturally improved by a front door like the Martello Tower had. But if Master Tommy was headstrong, Master Jackie was self-willed too and through the maxim that every little Irishman's house is his castle, he fell upon his hated rifle and to such purpose that the would-be assailant came to grief and alas to relance the coveted castle too. Needless to say, the cries of discomfited Master Tommy drew the attention of the girlfriends. Come here, Tommy, at once. And you, Jackie, for shame to throw poor Tommy in the dirty sand. Wait till I catch you for that. His eyes misty with unshed tears, Master Tommy came at her call, for their big sister's word was law with the twins. Nasty, bold Jackie. She put an arm around the little mariner and coaxed winningly. What's your name? Butter and cream? Tell who is your sweetheart. Is Sissy your sweetheart? No. Is Edie Boardman your sweetheart? No. I know, I know who is Tommy's sweetheart. Gertie is Tommy's sweetheart. No, Tommy said on the verge of tears. Sissy's quick mother wit guessed what was amiss and she whispered to Edie Boardman to take him there behind the push car where the gentleman couldn't see and to mind he didn't wet his new tan shoes. But who was Gertie? Bertie MacDowell, who was seated near her companions, lost in thought, gazing far away into the distance, was in very truth as fair a specimen of winsome Irish girlhood as one could wish to see. She was pronounced beautiful by all who knew her, though as folks often said, she was more a guilt trap than a MacDowell. The waxen pallor of her face was almost spiritual in its ivory-like purity, 
Though her rosebud mouth was a genuine Cupid's bow, quickly perfect. Her hands were a finely veiled alabaster, with tapering fingers and as white as lemon juice and queen of ointments could make them, though it was not true that she used to wear kid gloves in bed or take a milk foot bath either. Bertha Supple told that once to Edie Boardman, a deliberate lie when she was black out of daggers drawn with Gertie. The girl chums had of course their little tiffs from time to time, like the rest of mortals. And she told her not to let on whatever she did, that it was her that told her or she'd never speak to her again. No, honor where honor is due. There was an innate refinement, a languid queenly hauteur about Gertie, which was unmistakably evidence in her delicate hands and high arched in step, had kind fate, but willed her to be born a gentlewoman of high degree in her own right, and had she only received the benefits of a good education, Gertie MacDowell might easily have held her own beside any lady in the land and have seen herself exquisitely gowned with jewels on her brow and patrician suitors at her feet vying with one another to pay their devoirs to her. That man, his face there in the twilight, how one and strangely sad. It's the saddest face I have ever seen. Oh, I wish to God they'd take their squalling babies home out of that and not get on my nerves no hour to be out. Those brats of twins. Oh, that man. His eyes burning into me as though he would read my very soul. Dark eyes and a pale intellectual face like a matinee doll, a foreigner perhaps, and in deep mourning. The story of a haunting sorrow written on his face. Oh, I'd give worlds to know what it is. I'm glad I put on my transparent stockings. Exasperating little brats of twins, little monkeys common as ditch. Oh, those eyes. Burning eyes fixing themselves on me again, drinking in every contour, literally worshipping at my shrine. Is it? Oh, look, sissy, it's fireworks! Come on, Gertie, it's the bizarre fireworks! I'm not at their beck and call if they want to run like Rossies. Oh, those eyes, fastened on me, white hot passion in that face, passion silent and secret as the grave, a man to be trusted to his death, steadfast, a sterling man, a man of inflexible honour to his fingertips, Oh, now he can see all my graceful, beautifully shaped legs, supple and soft and delicately rounded. The passion of men like that, hot-blooded. I can almost feel him draw my face to his and that first quick touch of his hot, handsome lips. Besides, there's absolution so long as you don't do the other thing before being married. And there ought to be women priests that would understand without you telling out. And now he can see my other things too. Nain Sook knickers, that fabric that caresses the skin and I'm not ashamed and he isn't either to look in that immodest way because he couldn't resist the sight of that wondrous revelment half ordered and oh, rocket bang shot blind and oh, then the Roman candle bursting out and oh, oh, in raptures and gushing out of its stream of rain, gold hair threads, all green dewy stars falling with golden, oh, so lovely, oh, so sweet, soft, soft, then all melted away duly in the grey air. All was silent. Oh. Slowly and without looking back, she went down the uneven strand. She walked with a certain quiet dignity, characteristic of her, but with care and very slowly because Gertie McDowell was... Wait, no, she's lame. <laughs> Hot little devil all the same. Wouldn't mind. Oh, begins to feel cold and clammy. After effect, not pleasant. Still, you have to get rid of it some way. Only my watch stopped at half past four. Was that just when he, she? Oh, 
he did in Tahor, she did Don. Oh, well, I had that. Not the same, but. Bailey light flashing, hill of hoth. All quiet on hoth now, where we, the rhododendrons. I'm a fool, perhaps. He gets the plums and I the plum stones. Love, law him be handsome, for tomorrow we die. How many years is it now? Up there on the head of Hoth, she and me. This time of year, below us, bay, sleeping sky. Pillowed on my coat, she had her hair, earwigs in the heather scrub. My hands under her nape. You'll toss me all. I wonder. Cool, soft ointments or hand. Touched me, caressed. Ravaged over her I lay. Full lips, full open, kissed her mouth. Young life. Soft, warm, sticky gum jelly lips. Flowers her eyes were. Take me. Willing eyes. She lay still. Wildly I lay on her, kissed her eyes, her lips, her stretched neck, beating her woman's breasts, full in her blouse of nuns, veilings, fat nipples upright, all yielding. She tossed my hair, she kissed me. I was kissed, kissed. She kissed me, me. And me now. Tired, drained all the, the manhood out of me. What's that flying about? That probably. Bell scared him out, I suppose. Mass seems to be over. Could hear them all at it. Pray for us and pray for us and pray for us. Good idea, the repetition. Same thing with ads. Boy from us and boy from us. <laughs> Exhausted that female has me, not so young now. We'll never meet again, but it was lovely. Goodbye, dear. Thanks. Made me feel so young. Night Town, the phantasmagoric world where the veil between this world and the next, the real and the imagined, the conscious and the unconscious is rent apart. The Mabbitt Street entrance of Night Town, before which stretches an uncobbled tram siding set with skeleton tracks, red and green will-o'-the-wisps and danger signals. Rows of flimsy houses with gaping doors, round rabbiotis, halted ice gondola, stunted men and women squabble, Whistles call and answer. Wait me love and I'll be with you. Ran in the stable. A woman screams, a child wails, figures wander, lock, peer from wardens. The famished snaggled tusks of an elderly bard protrude from a doorway. I gave it to Molly because she was jolly, the leg of the duck, the leg of the duck. 
Signs on you, hairy arse. He has it, she's got it, wherever she put it. The leg of the duck, the leg of the duck. Stephen Dedalus and his companions stagger into night town. In the beginning was the word, and the end of the world without end. Way ho for the parson. What ho, parson? Vidi aquam, egradiantum, de templo a latare dextro, alleluia, salvi facti sunt. Pornosophical philotheology, metaphysics in Mecklenburg Street. St, come here till I tell you. Maidenheads inside. St. Et homines ad quas pere venite aquista. Trinity medicals, fallopian tube, all prick and no pence. An age of exhausted wisdom groping for its God. Are you out of the seminary? Out of it. <laughs> the agony in the closet. Oh, I'm sure you're a spoiled priest or a monk. He's a cardinal's son. Cardinal sin. Monks of the screw. Not too much of this. I'm partially drunk, by the way. Where the hell are you going? Letterous links to La Belle Dame sans mercy. Snakes of river fog creep slowly. From drains, clefts, cesspools, middens arise on all sides of stagnant fumes. In the convex mirror, grin unstuck the bonomise and fat chuck cheat chops of jolly poldy the rick sticks doldy. Stitch in my side, why did I run? Well, goose chase this, this orderly houses. Lord knows where Stephen and them are gone. What am I following them for? Still deadless is the best of that lot. He'll lose that cash. Soon got, soon gone. Pat Street, any good on your mind? She won't get a virgin in the flash house. Ten shillings a maidenhead, fresh thing, never touched. Are you looking for someone? He's inside with friend. Is this Mrs. Max? No, 81. Mrs. Cowan's mother slipper slapper. She's on the job herself tonight with the vet. Belle Cohen, whore mistress, enters. My word, I'm all a muck sweat. Married, I see, and the missus is master. Petticoat government. That is so powerful being. In my eyes, read that slumber which women love, exuberant female, enormously. I desiderate your domination. I'm exhausted, abandoned, no more young. I stand, so to speak, with the unposted letter bearing the extra regulation fee before the too late box of the General Post Office of Human Life. All things end, points downwards. You may. You must. Bella raises her gown slightly and lifts to the edge of a chair a plump busk and hoof and a full pastern silk stocked. Bloom, stiff-legged, aging, bends over her hoof and with gentle finger draws out and in her laces. If you bungle handy, Andy, I'll kick your football for you. Awaiting your further orders, we remain gentlemen. Down. On the hands down. Truffles. With a piercing epileptic cry, he sinks on all fours. Bella places her heel on his neck and grinds it in. Feel my entire weight. Bow, bond slave, before the throne of your despot's glorious heels, so glistening in their proud erectness. Promise never to help to disobey. Holy smoke, you little know what's in store for you. I'll bet Kentucky cocktails all around. I'll shame it out of you. He didn't mean it. Bella, he'll be good. Come, ducky dear. I want a word with you, darling, just to administer correction, just a little heart-to-heart -heart talk. Now, that's a good boy now. Bella grasps his hair violently and drags him forward. I only want to correct you for your own good on a soft, safe spot. How's that tender behind? Ah! Oh, ever so gently, pet. Begin to get ready. Don't tear my trousers. Gee up! Ride a cock horse to Bambury Cross. <laughs> You're in for it this time. I'll make you remember me for the balance of your natural life. This will hurt you. Bella twists Bloom's arm. Oh, it's hell itself. 
Every nerve in my body aches like mad. Now, for your punishment, Frock, you will shed your male garments, you understand? And as the girls are now, so will you be. Wigged, perfume sprayed, rice powdered with smooth shaven armpits. I tried her things on only once, a small prank. It was Gerald converted me to be a true corset lover when I was a female impersonator in the high school play, vice versa. The sins of your past are rising against you, many hundreds. What was the most revolting piece of obscenity in all your career of crime? You get out. I remember repugnosed and repugnant. What else are you good for? An impotent thing like you. Can you do a man's job? Eccles Street. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't hurt your feelings for the world, but there's a man of brawn and passion there. Wait for nine months, my lad. He shot his bolt. He's no eunuch. That makes you wild, don't it? Touches the spot, spittoon. I was indecently treated. I will inform the police to drive me mad. Mal, I forgot. Forgive, Mal. We, we still good? Cry, Babby. Crocodile tears. My willpower. I have sinned. I have suffered. Nace is boiling. His straw boater set sideways. A red flower in his mouth struts in. Bloom appears in a flunky's plum plush coat and knee breeches, buff stockings. Hello, Bloom. Mrs. Bloom up here? I'm afraid not, sir. The last articles. Here, uh, to buy yourself a gin and splash. Blazes tosses Bloom's sixpence and hangs his hat smartly on a peg of Bloom's antlered head. I have a little private business with your wife. <laughs> you understand. Thank you, sir. I will, sir. May I bring two chumps to witness the deed and take a, a, a snapshot? Uh, Vaseline, sir. Orange flower? Lukewarm water? Oh, he simply idolizes every bit of her. Look. Stuck together, covered with kisses. Yum, yum. Oh, he's carrying her around the room, doing it. Ride a cock horse. You could hear them in Paris and New York like mouthfuls of strawberries and cream. Show, hi, show, plower, more, shoot. Oh, Leopold lost the pin of his drawers. He didn't know what to do to keep it up, to keep it up. How's your middle leg? I come here till I stiffen it for you. Caught in the act? I'm doing good to the others. The friend of man, trained by kindness. Name and address? I've forgotten for the moment. Oh, yes, Dr. Bloom, Leopold, dental surgeon. You have heard of Von Bloom Pasha, owns half of Austria, Egypt, cousin. You ought to be thoroughly ashamed of yourself. Gentlemen of the jury, let me explain. I am a man misunderstood. I'm being made a scapegoat of. I'm a respectable married man without a stain on my character. I live in Eccles Street. My wife is the daughter of a most distinguished commander. What do you call him? Major Brian Tweedy, one of Britain's fighting men who helped win our battles. Ah, turncoat, up the boars. Moses, Moses, king of the Jews, wiped his arse in the daily news. <laughs> Order in the court. He can give you the best references. I have moved in the charm circle of the highest. I was chatting this afternoon at the Vice Regal Lodge to my old pals, Sir Robert and Lady Ball, Astronomer Royal at the Levee. Sir Bob, I said. Arrest him, Constable. He saw me on the polo grounds of the Phoenix Park at the match All Ireland versus the rest of Ireland. The plebeian Don Juan observed me from behind a hackney car and sent me in double envelopes an obscene photograph, such as are sold after dark on the Paris boulevards, insulting to any lady. I have it still. It represents a partially nude senorita, frail and lovely, practicing illicit intercourse with a muscular torero, evidently a blackguard. He urged me to do likewise, to misbehave, to sin with the officers of the garrison. He implored me to soil 
his letter in an unspeakable manner to chastise him as he richly deserves to bestride and ride him to give him a most vicious horse whipping. Who'll hang Julius Iscariot? Lynch him! Roast him! He's as bad as Parnell was. This is Midsummer Madness, some ghastly joke again. By heaven, I'm guiltless as the Ansan Snow. Fellow countrymen, I call on my old friend Dr. Malachi Mulligan, sex specialist, to give medical testimony on my behalf. Well, Dr. Bloom is bisexually abnormal. He has recently escaped from Dr. Eustace's private asylum for demented gentlemen. Born out of wedlock, hereditary epilepsy is present, the consequence of unbridled lust. There are marked symptoms of chronic exhibitionism. He's prematurely bald from self-abuse, perversely idealistic in consequence, a reformed rake, and has metal teeth. I believe him to be more sinned against than sinning. I've made a pervaginal examination, and after application of the acid test of 5,427 anal, axillary, pectoral, and pubic hairs, I declare him to be Virgo intacta. Professor Bloom is a finished example of the new womanly man. His moral nature is simple and lovable. I appeal for clemency in the name of the most sacred word our vocal organs have ever called upon to speak. He's about to have a baby. I so want to be a mother. Embrace me tight, dear. You'll soon be over tight, dear. Bloom embraces her tightly and bears eight male yellow and white children. Bloom, are you the Messiah Ben Joseph or Ben David? You have said it. Then perform a miracle, ya cod. Ya hag, ya hag, ya dirty dog, you think the ladies love ya. My beloved subjects, a new era is about to dawn. I, Bloom, tell you verily, it is even now at hand. Yea, on the word of the Bloom, ye shall ere long enter into the golden city, which is to be the new blue musalem in the Nova Hibernia of the future. Thirty-two workmen wearing rosettes from all the counties in Ireland, under the guidance of Derwin the Builder, construct the new Bloom Usalem. It is a colossal edifice with crystal roof built in the shape of a huge pork kidney. All the people cast soft pantomime stones at Bloom. Brother Buzz places a bag of gunpowder around his neck. Lieutenant, Lieutenant Myers of the Dublin Fire Rig Department, by general request, sets fire to Bloom. A con, a con, a con, oh. Weep not for me, O oh daughters of Aaron. A choir of 600 voices, conducted by Mr. Vincent O'Brien, sing the Alleluia Chorus, accompanied on the organ by Joseph Glynn. Bloom becomes mute, shrunken, carbonized.
Goodbye to my sleep for this night, anyhow. Oh, I hope he's not going to get in with those medicals. Leasing him astray to imagine he's young again. Coming in at four in the morning, it must be. Squandering money and getting drunker and drunker. I'll knock him off that little habit tomorrow. First I look at his shirt to see. Oh, I'll see if he still has that French letter in his pocketbook. I suppose he thinks I don't know. Deceitful men, all their 20 pockets aren't enough for their lies. Why can't you kiss a man without going and marrying him first? Oh, you sometimes love too wildly when you feel that way. So nice all over. You can't help yourself. I wish some man or other would take me some time and kiss me in his arms. There's nothing like a kiss, hot and down to your soul, almost paralyzes you. And I hate that confession when I used to go to Father Corrigan. Oh, he touched me, Father. What harm if he did? Where? And I said, on the canal bank, like a fool. But whereabouts on your person, my child? On the leg? Behind? High up, was it? Yes, rather high up. Was it where you sit down? Yes. Oh, Lord. Couldn't he just say bottom right out and have done with it? And what did he want to know for when I'd already confessed it to God? He had a nice fat hand. The palm moist always. I wouldn't mind feeling it. Neither would he, I'd say, by the bull neck and his horse collar. I'd like to be embraced by one in his vestments and the smell of incense off him like the Pope. Besides, there's no danger with a priest if you're married. Oh, move over your big carcass out of that for the love of Mike. Listen to him. The winds that waft my sights to thee. So well may he sleep and sigh the great suggester. Tanpoldo de la Flora. Oh, I suppose there isn't in all creation another man with the habits he has. Look at the way he's sleeping at the foot of the bed. Nobody understands his cracked ideas but me. Oh, I wonder was Boyle and satisfied with me. One thing I didn't like was him slapping me behind going away in the hall, though I laughed. I'm not a horse or an ass, am I? I think he made them a bit firmer, sucking them like that so long. He made me thirsty. Titties, he calls them. Stiff the nipple guests for the least thing. They're supposed to represent beauty placed up there, like those statues in the museum. Are they so beautiful? Of course. Compared with what a man looks like with his two bagfuls and his other thing hanging down out of him or sticking up at you like a hat rack. No wonder they cover it with a cabbage leaf. I had a great breast of milk with Millie. Enough for two. I had to get him to suck them, they were so hard. He said it was sweeter and thicker than cows. Then he wanted to milk me into the tea. He's beyond everything, I declare. Someone ought to put him into the budget. They want everything in their mouth. All the pleasure those men get off a woman. Oh, I can feel his mouth. Oh, Lord, I wish he was here or somebody to let myself go with. I feel all fire inside me. I must stretch myself. Better lower this lamp. Get up early and go down to Lambs and get them to send up some flowers about the place. I love flowers. I'd love to have the whole place swimming in roses. 
God in heaven, there's nothing like nature, the wild mountains and the sea and the waves rushing, all sorts of shapes and smells and colours spring up out of the ditches. Does your heart good to see? The sun shines for you, he said, the day we were lying among the rhododendrons on Hope's head and the grey tweed suit and his straw hat. The day I got him to propose to me, yes. First I gave him the bishop's seed cake out of my mouth and it was leap year, like now, 16 years ago. My God, after that long kiss near lost my breath. Yes, he said I was a flower of the mountain. Yeah, so we are flowers all, a woman's body. That was the one true thing he said in his life. And the sun shines for you today. Yes, that was why I liked him. Because I saw he understood or felt what a woman is. I knew I could always get around him. And I gave him all the pleasure I could, leading him on till he asked me to say yes. And I wouldn't answer first, only looked out over the sea and the sky. I was thinking of so many things he didn't know of. Oh, and the sea. The sea crimson sometimes like fire and the glorious sunset. And the fig trees and the Alameda gardens and the rose gardens and the jasmine and the geraniums and the cactuses in Gibraltar as a girl, where I was a flower of the mountain. Yes, when I put the rose in my hair like the Andalusians used, or shall I wear red? Yes, and how he kissed me under the Moorish wall. And I thought, as well him as another. And then I asked him with my eyes to kiss me again. And then I asked him with my eyes to ask me again. Yes. And then he asked me, would I? Yes. To say yes, my mountain flower. And first I put my arms around him, yes, and drew him down to me so he could feel my breasts all perfume. Yes. And his heart was going like mad. And yes, I said, yes, I will. Yes. Sure.
We hope you've enjoyed this special pandemic performance of Zoom's Day, I mean, Bloom's Day, with our wonderful performers, John Rafter Lee, Johnny O'Callaghan, Sonia Makari, Sheila Birmingham, and James Lancaster. And I want to also acknowledge our wonderful musicians. The musical director for Bloomsday was Stephen Carr, who also performed on piano. The gorgeous tenor was Dermot Kiernan, who also performed on guitar. And the beautiful fiddle music was from Morgan O'Shaughnessy, who also edited the sound. And now to paraphrase James Joyce and Dubliners, we lived and laughed and loved, and now we must leave. So good night to all of you, and thank you so much for joining us. <laughs>